I'm gonna talk about how to solve a problem like North Korea. This is a place that's often described by policymakers as the land of no good options. And if we look at it in its regional context, it's easy to see why. And by the way, I know that the United States is not actually located there, but <laughs> they do have 28,000 troops uh, in South Korea, so it brings them right into the picture. Frankly speaking, this is a mess of powers with different interests and competing, inter uh, competing strategies. And in the middle of that, we have North Korea, which is a prototypical rogue state. They've shown themselves to be incredibly impervious to external pressure over the years. And so how do we solve a problem like this? I, I have no idea. I don't know how to solve this problem. However, I did say I was going to uh, talk about how to solve a problem like North Korea, so we're going to have to look at it from a different angle. That's not the level of high politics. It's the ground level. It's the perspective of the North Korean people. And in fact, I want to get even more micro than this. I want to tell you about one North Korean friend of mine. This is Shin Dong-hyuk. Dong-hyuk was born in a political prison camp in North Korea in 1982. He was supposed to live out his whole life there because his blood was supposed to be guilty. The fact that we have this picture belies the fact that that was not his destiny. In fact, when he was 21 years old, a new prisoner came into the camp, and Shin was tasked with showing him the ropes. This new prisoner happened to have come from the ruling elite. It actually had a relatively good life in Pyongyang, and he began to tell Shin about the outside world. Shin was learning for the first time basic things, really simple things like what it's like to eat meat. And he says that this information drove him crazy. He wanted to escape and experience these things for himself so badly. And so one time when he was working near the edge of the camp, he seized his chance and he escaped. For Shin, this outside information was absolutely crucial in driving him to not accept his reality, but to change it. And I believe that what's true for Shin can be true at the macro level as well for the North Korean people. Thankfully, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've actually seen a lot of grassroots level change in North Korea. And this, these changes may eventually make that possible, make that macro level change in North Korea possible. So basically, prior to the uh, 1990s in North Korea, the North Korean state controlled every important thing in North Korean society. After the North Korean state-controlled economy collapsed in the 90s, the grassroots marketization that emerged as a result started to eat away, started to consume those roles from the state. Perhaps most interesting among these is that the markets have become an increasingly important source of information and technology to the North Korean people in a way that's very hard to control by the North Korean state. And we've seen over the last year in other countries how big a scale of change is possible when people are exposed to new flows of information and the new spread of ideas and how that can be facilitated by technology. It's important to note here that collapse is not necessarily the only pathway for change. When governments feel that rise up of pressure, when they see the, North, uh, see, see the people becoming more empowered, they can respond to that by proactively uh, reforming and by changing their ways. But history shows us that authoritarian governments cannot continue to deny the people their basic human dignities when those people become sufficiently empowered. So basically, governments face a choice. They have to either change their ways or they, or they will be changed out. Let's get back to North Korea. It's still the most closed off country in the world. Because they don't have the internet, North Korean people are denied several of these tools that have been seen as instrumental in accelerating people power in other parts of the world. However, they do have these technologies. And they're already being used to access and share information that would have been unthinkable just 10 years ago. So for instance, North Korean families and small groups of friends are now gathering to watch South Korean dramas on smuggled DVDs. North Korean fishermen are listening to South Korean broadcasts 
mainly because the weather broadcasts on South Korean broadcasts, weather forecasts on South Korean broadcasts are so much more reliable. We also have North Koreans in the border regions using illegal Chinese mobile phones to establish crucial lines of contact with the outside world. And these are often used to maintain contact with people that have already left the country, so North Korean refugees. There are even people reading Wikipedia pages that have been downloaded onto USB sticks and they're being smuggled into the country. So as this new information and these new ideas come into the country, the North Korean people are becoming empowered and the hunger for change will increase. And as that information is shared and traded and is even beginning to be discussed, the North Korean people will grow and strengthen their bonds between each other. North Korea is probably one of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century that continues into the 21st. But if we look at the North Korean people, there is hope. And if we can help to empower the North Korean people, including through providing new sources of information and ideas and the technology that helps to drive that, then maintaining the status quo in North Korea will become increasingly untenable. And change in North Korea will not be impossible, it will be inevitable. Thank you.